Uh, first of all, welcome to everybody who's um, taken the time to uh, listen to me today. I am here in Melbourne, Australia, beautiful Melbourne, Australia, and it's uh, early afternoon for us, so whatever time it is for you, uh, I appreciate the efforts that you make to um, listen to what we have to say. So let's talk about today and what we plan to cover in the next 45 minutes. What I plan to do, I will be going through all the slides and I hope they'll just take 45 minutes, which will leave us 15 minutes afterwards to answer uh, any questions that you have. But please uh, type in the questions in the Q&A section on, on your console uh, as you think of them and remember them so that, uh, you know, it's kind of almost first in, first serve. So make sure you get your answers in uh, when, when you actually think of them and then we'll have a chance to answer them. So today I want to talk about IT risk and controls, just basically to give you guys a bit of a background on how they work. This is an area that's not uh, well understood by most IT managers and certainly uh, people who work in the development stream of software, uh, mostly because you know it's not covered when we take our training and uh, the usual response to auditors and risk and compliance people is to see if you can duck under your desk and just pretend you're not there every time they walk by. Um, and, you know, as a result, because you don't understand what they're talking about, it's really hard to have meaningful discussions with them and, uh, and actually get anywhere in uh, resolving any differences that you have. Um, so, I'm going to talk a bit about that. And then uh, I want to focus on some of the things about continued delivery that reduce the risk uh, in IT as a whole, but, but also in the software or solution delivery practices. And then on the, the last point I want to make is that I am not going to do uh, continuous delivery 101 here. I'm going to have to assume that you guys all have that level of understanding of what continuous delivery is. and um, if you don't have that, at the end of this session, I have a reference slide that gives some pretty good references on where you can go and get some basic information. If you want to do a deep dive into it, also uh, some other references. So to start with, just the outline, give you a little bit on risk background, give you a little bit of information on how to manage IT risk, or you know, this is a more theoretical level. Then we'll go into the continuous delivery and the concepts that are related to IT risk and hopefully demonstrate how they actually reduce it. This is not really difficult stuff. Uh, it's just an ability for us to understand the language of risk and compliance people uh, and security people and be able to talk to them about continuous delivery and how it actually reduces risk as opposed to some of the other approaches that they're more familiar with. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, common control barriers that are thrown up when you start talking about continuous delivery within IT departments. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the risks actually involved with going down the path of continuous delivery and hopefully uh, get to a conclusion about 40 minutes from now. So IT risk. I just want to talk a little bit about what it is and what it isn't. And the first thing you've got to understand is IT risk is not compliance. Compliance is part of risk in that if you don't meet compliance, either industry uh, compliance or uh, laws within the jurisdictions that you operate in, you run the risk of getting fined, having your operations set, shut down, or uh, you know, your rep loss of reputation uh, within the greater public uh, domain. So, but really, IT risk is much more than just meeting compliance. So unfortunately, this is the area that a lot of people focus on because they just don't understand compliance. Uh, the next point is IT risk is not all about information security uh, for the same reasons. Information security is very important. There are a lot of risks involved with um, handling certain types of information, financial information, uh, information about your customers, private information about your customers, uh, and, and some laws and standards and regulations around that. And then, of course, you know, even just protecting your information from getting out into the greater public domain where 
say maybe your competitors could use that information. But IT risk is not always only about information security. So again, it's more than just information security. What everybody needs to understand, and the business people, if there are any business people who are, are in with us today, you need to understand this too, that IT risk is a business risk. It is not isolated to the IT department to take care of. This is something that the corporation as a whole, the Board of Governors, if, it's, if, if you have one, and most corporations do, but even you as individuals, if you're just in a small startup, you have a responsibility to recognize that your IT risks are a business risk. And there's many reasons for that, but the largest one is that IT, uh, you know, information technology is integrated into business operations and the services that you provide to the customers. I can't think of, like, you know, there's very, very few organizations where this is not the case. Just the fact that you're dialing in today, I bet wherever you're sitting or listening to this, you're using technology. It, it is involved with almost every aspect of our lives today, and that's no different for a business. Uh, secondly, you know, uh, technology changes the landscape of the business. There's a lot of uh, external factors, but if you think of maybe even five or six years ago, uh, where we were with technologies, who would have known what the advent of the smartphones and, and the use of the technology there, as well as now we're looking at uh, stuff like you know notebooks and how people are using them on a regular basis. It's completely turning technology and, and businesses on its head. Think, uh, I was reading an article in The Economist earlier this week about how 3D printing is going to revolutionize manufacturing again throughout the world. Uh, as 3D printers become more readily available, uh, the prices go down, the technology improves. You know, what people are predicting is what's going to happen is we're going, we're, we're going to be able to manufacture just about anything using one piece of equipment. And you think of what that means for people who own large factories. They need to get on top of that today, understand how it's going to impact their business, and again, change their use of technology to uh, help mitigate any risk to their organizations as a result. So the first thing, when you look at IT risk management, business risk management, the first step is always to identify your risk. There's a lot of different factors that go into risk. And if you look at risk as an event that will have an adverse effect on your business, um, that could mean just about anything. From an IT perspective, even, there are external factors. So changing market conditions, getting new competitors who are using new technologies, uh, new technology itself that's just coming into the market, or new regulations or laws that are going to be in place are all external factors that may pose risk to your organization. Internal factors are things like operational incidents that may result as a result of a change within your systems or uh, even not a change, just things wearing out and not being current. Project failures are another one. You could have full strategic strategies which is uh, mandated by the business and all of a sudden what you were doing today just isn't going to work. And, it, and mergers are another one where you get lots of huge IT risk as a result of having to absorb legacy systems from, from different corporations and making them all work together. So identifying the risk is really important. It's like what is the likelihood that this is going to happen and then what is the impact that it's going to have. And of course there's sort of a a sweet point there where you want to think things that are really going to happen, you know it's going to happen, and it's going to have a huge impact on the organization. Those are things that you have to mitigate. Um, you have to also identify the dependencies between risks and, there, and, and figure out, you know, is there one that I have to deal with or do I have to deal with a group of them? But, you know, with regards to information technology, that can get pretty complicated. And, and a lot of people have developed processes and controls around that to sort of mitigate the risk and, and help 
brings some, I, I guess, what I could call it, uh, control or, or command sort of to ensure that chaos doesn't ensue. So what happens is when you, if you've identified risk, you've got to identify what your, uh, and the dependencies, what the response is going to be to the risk. So this is where it gets really interesting. Because if you put too much control and try to reduce the risk too much, what you have is that IT becomes a value inhibitor to the business. It takes too long to get things done. And usually symptoms are that there's a command and control uh, aspect to trying to maintain order within the organization and the use of tech, IT, techno, IT. You also have a failure to realize opportunity because things take a really long time to change. You get bigger projects with a lot of bloat in them. You're working on large chunks of work that are tightly coupled and integrated with each other. So as a consequence, you have latent feedback cycles where disparate groups are working on things that are related, but you throw them all together at the last minute to see if they're going to work. Uh, there's usually poor quality uh, in the product that actually is moved into production. Yeah, you know, it's good enough. At least it might be better than what we had, but it certainly isn't as good as we were expecting. Uh, you have lots of inflexible processes where people say that you have to do this process, you have to pass through these gates all, each and every time. Um, you have functional silos working, and I, I talked about that before, and, and really um, tight, tight control with long delivery cycles that may be months, years for different projects. Now, if you're, what you want to do is move, move over to the right side of this slide where IT is a value enabler and you're actually getting more leverage from the use of technology and this is where you have teams that are allowed to be a little more self-regulating and that the controls are probably more along the guidelines. These are the things you must do. However, it doesn't really tell you specifically that you have to do it this way all the time. And, the, and this is a real key concept to bear in mind when you're having discussions with risk control uh, security people, auditors, is that they have this vision of how you operate and it's your job to give them your perspective and the perspective of the organization on why you're doing it this way. Because often what times they'll come in and say, you know what, I learned it this way and I think you should do it this way. And that's probably one of the worst ways to implement a control. The better way is to sit down with these people and say, okay, We've got these needs to do these things, and, and let's work out the way we can make IT as a value enabler by um, allowing teams to be more self-regulating, having smaller ongoing continuous improvements, and, and allowing the business to respond quickly to opportunities through the use of IT. Uh, you're able to apply new technologies relatively quickly. Uh, when you have small change increments with the fast feedback cycles, and quality built into your product, that is when you become an IT value enabler. And then you also have fast, faster delivery times. So when you're doing an IT risk response, you want to prevent bad things from happening. That's a risk event. Um, I want to make this really clear, and everybody really needs to understand, that you can't prevent all bad things from happening all the time. Some things you just don't want to touch because even if they do happen, there's nothing you can do about it. So when you're going through, you know, all the risks that you identified, there will be some that you throw out immediately and say, you know what, even if this happened, we can't do anything about it uh, given what, where we're at. And, you know, those are generally catastrophic events. And I think of all the people who are working and living in um, in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, sitting on a major earthquake fault, you know, what can you do to uh, prevent the impact of an earthquake? But can you prevent the earthquake? No. Okay? So you just got to look at it this way. But when you're thinking of, well, what can we do to reduce the, the impact of those events, there's a lot of factors that you have to consider. You know, what are your resources? How much money have you got? Budget to throw at it? Do you have the people with the, with the skills and capabilities to actually reduce that risk? Uh, can you outsource that? Um, 
how important is this to you? Uh, some things may not be important at all. Like there's a risk that somebody may be able to do something, but you, can, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. If it happens, I'll worry about it then because it doesn't have a very large impact on the organization. Uh, do I have the tools to actually help deal with this? Do I, do I need to go out and actually learn new, new skills, spend some money, implement new tools, more tools, or maybe can I adapt the tools that I have today to help me and, or maybe leverage them a little bit better to help me reduce risk. And of course, the other thing is how much time have I got to deal with this? And this becomes quite critical when you're talking about um, compliance, particularly to new laws within the jurisdictions that you operate. And generally, governments uh, are pretty good at, at saying, you know, we'll give you 12 months, 18 months, two years, and then, you know, they'll make an announcement uh, 12 months into the program, oh, we've extended that deadline. So, uh, this is usually only when you're going into a new industry that's heavily regulated that you have to worry about the time. So, I want to talk a little bit more about management and trying to figure out what's the right level of control and, and, and need to emphasize with everybody again. This is a decision that is made between the business and IT around the controls, the amount of controls that you need. Your security people, your risk and compliance people, your auditors, are there to provide you with advice. They are there to say, yeah, that would meet a control or not. It is not their decision to determine the level of risk that you accept as an organization. That is the role of the business. The business makes that decision. And then I've often been in audit findings and, and uh, responses to audit findings where we just say, you know what, thank you very much for letting us know about this, but and we have looked at it and we've determined that we're not going to do anything about it because we're just fine the way it is today. Um, and the, and that's, that's an acceptable response, but it's about the visibility and transparency of making that decision. So I always talk about running with scissors when I look at organizations. Sometimes they say, okay, those guys are on a rocky road going uphill. They got many pairs of scissors in each hand and all the pointy ends are sticking towards their abdomen. Um, but, you know, there's various levels of, of running with scissors. And, and what can happen is that usually it's your security people and your risk and compliance that don't know, not any scissors allowed. So a good example was maybe six or seven years ago, uh, maybe even ten years ago, when companies started putting workstations on everybody's desk and they ha all had access to the Internet. And, and a lot of companies, not even been in some, you know, quite recently within the last year, where people aren't allowed to have external access to the Internet without express written approval by some manager. Um, and this was the response, oh no, we're not going to let people go on the Internet. But what they found out was that, oh, geez, you know what, some of these people could really benefit from using the Internet in their day-to-day -day functions that they perform for our organization. So what can we do? And then, and then you'll get a, a security response. Okay, you know, in this place, I'll give you something but it's totally useless. Um, or, you know, this is as much as we think we can carry. So in the case of the Internet, it was, oh, okay, only certain groups can do this with approval, or, uh, okay, but we're going to screen all the sites, and we're only going to allow ones that we think are uh, appropriate for business. And uh, so, you know, that's where I would go in and say, I need to go look up this information on some website and only find out that it's been blocked by... Um, the IT security teams. Uh, and, then, and then there's a more reasonable approach to say, you know what, we as a business recognize we need scissors and we really need sharp pointy long, long blades to work. Or in, and so this is a, you know, we need to access the internet. So let's, let's just give full open access, allow people to be self-regulating. But we know that there are places that we definitely don't want people to go to. So, uh, you know, uh, triple X sites are, are completely ruled out. You're not going to be able to get in there. And anything that we know is a known gambling site, you're not going to be able to get in there. And, uh, you know, other, other maybe some chat rooms and that sort of thing. But, but basically, it, it's a more reasonable approach where the business is still allowed to leverage the technology uh, and move, move on and keep up w with all of its competitors and the people who are actually doing their jobs have the tool sets to do it. But there's a, a reasonable level of control around it. Um, so 
cloud services is an example right now where there's a lot of debate, you know, like security people, oh, no, 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 you can't use cloud services because it's, it's too risky. And, you, and then that's where you have to have the conversation and say, well, you know what, we could really propel the business forward if we're able to use cloud services. So why don't we sit down and have a discussion about what's appropriate level of security when we do use cloud services? How should we be setting up our accounts so that we know that we have done as much as we can to mitigate any security risks there might be in using this service? So in the end, it becomes a matter of balance. So if you have too many restrictive controls, that little puppy, he's going to sit right on the top and not move at all and be unable to respond. But if you have too little controls, you'll actually fall off. And, you, and what happens in IT, when you don't have enough controls, particularly in larger shops, you start to get lots of operational risk and you, you have a failure to move ahead. So either way, if you have too many controls or too few controls, you are not able to move the business forward uh, in a manner where there's acceptable level of risk. So let's get on to continuous delivery and uh, talk about what it is and how it works with reducing IT risk. So what you see up there on the slide is um, Jez and Dave's uh, description of what continuous delivery is. It's fast automated feedback on the production readiness of your applications every time there's a change. And one of the common things that happens when we go in and we talk to uh, business people and even IT people about starting down a continuous uh, delivery journey is they go, we can't, we can't put in changes, uh, you know, multiple times a day or, or even multiple times a week. And we really have to calm people down at this point and say, you know what, when we talk about continuous delivery, we're not talking about continuous deployment, which is what a Flickr does, where you go in and they're all, uh, doing changes to their website multiple times a day. Um, what it is, is that the code that we have worked on, the systems that we are, it goes into, we have a really high level of confidence due to using fast automated feedback that it is production ready, okay? And that every change that you do into the system has to go through that feedback mechanism to ensure that the quality is built in. Now, that whether it's your code, your base code, whether it's the configuration on your infrastructure, and that would include networks, would also include, dare I say, firewalls, operating systems, databases, everything that is involved in making your systems work in production need to be treated as code and when there's, like you do with code, and when there's a change, it goes through the same rigor of scrutiny to make sure that it's going to work and it won't break anything else. This is re a really, really important concept about continuous delivery. Now the fact that, that those changes are ready to go into production doesn't mean that you have to just put them in production. If you're using toggles to turn features on and off, you can sort of bank them up. And then when the business is ready for the changes and they've got enough features to say, okay, that's a set that we want to release today, it can be done. And they are the ones who make the decisions when it goes into production. It's not a matter of waiting for IT to get it ready and get it complete. Uh, and, and get all of their different functional silos saying, okay, yeah, it's passed. This is about the business saying, okay, let's do it on this day, and IT can say, yep, we can. So it's a process. It has inputs. It has outputs. Your input is your requirement for change. Your output is that it's production ready, and it's not necessarily that it goes into production, but you could do that if you want, and it's all configuration items. So this concept about dealing with small feature chunks um, is really important as well. And that allows you to do the fast early feedback and do it building the quality in. So we talked about the software always being production ready 
And this minimizes the lead time from idea to live. So instead of having to wait even three weeks or two weeks on a normal agile iteration, and even then in the iteration you might have three or four of those for, before you actually have a release, what you're saying is that every time a, a, a feature you're dealing with small enough changes, I push it through, you know, and it's only a matter of days before I know that it's going to work or not. And again, that goes back to its IT is no longer viewed as being the bottleneck. It is the business who can say, okay, it's going to take three or four days and before we can actually see if it's going to work in production, and then we might get some feedback from actual customers to see if it's a good idea to follow. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But I would just to go about early feedback and important concepts here with continuous delivery. What's shown on the slide is what I call the test ice cream cone. That's what we're looking at, where the blue part is the automated parts, where you have maybe have some automated GUI tests, you have integrated tests and unit tests. What we go into a lot of organizations, we see this type of uh, geometry in the testing cycles. Uh, a lot of manual tests at the very end, trying to see if things work together, uh, not a lot of automation, and this heavy reliance on the manual tests, which is fraught with error because um, people make mistakes and things get forgotten or you just can't see it. What we prefer to see is a test pyramid where you have a small automated tests as the base when your unit and component tests on the actual base code that, that your developers are working on. So, you know, it's kind of like Toyota manufacturing. I'm really going to control uh, my, my source of supplies because uh, if I start with quality items, you know, the finished product is going to be quality. So this is the same concept. So heavy reliance on automation early and the developers get very early feedback of whether, you know, an inkling of whether it's going to work or not. You, and, and you can do some integration testing at, at this level and the next level where you actually stub out different systems and can see if, you know, on the basic functionality, is that going to work or will it break any other system that I have to integrate into. Uh, a lot of acceptance tests can be automated, GUI tests can be automated. And then, you're really only relying on light exploratory manual tests by people, a few select people who really know the application and the functionality and uh, can go in there and do a good job because they recognize the patterns and the use of the application, what may be loopholes or, or where, you know, if I tend to change something here, it breaks something uh, somewhere else, so I've got to go check that other place. But what happens is that because most of your tests are done at the bottom where there's fast feedback cycle and, and you know exactly what's changed, it's easier to fix something immediately after you do it than to wait, um, you know, even two weeks before you go back and fix it. Because then you go, know, what did I do? What could possibly be wrong? And there was a bunch of stuff in there that I did, and I'm not sure which one it is. But here it's like, I test it. Oh, it's broken. I fix it immediately. It's really easy and fast, and you have lower costs. And as you get further up on the higher end where you're doing manual intensive testing, that you have, it's more business facing and realistic. Treating everything as code is another big concept that, that is uh, important in continuous delivery. The slide here shows sort of a typical way of code is developed. So that green line there is my Java code and I probably have developers there who are doing pretty good uh, discipline practices around developing the code. But I also have some other lines, like my mainframe initiate, some uh, schedulers going in there, and other teams are working on those. And, uh, you know, we're going to try and integrate them in uh, at some point, and we'll do some regression testing to make sure we haven't uh, broken anything. But then you'll see the outliers uh, on the outside there, the operating environments, updates. You may have other updates going in. Basically, you're not even aware of what's going on there. And if there's something being changed that will either break those systems or will make your, uh, your particular product that you're delivering un unoperable. So what you really want to do is treat everything as code, is find out all the moving parts in the, that are required to make that system run and get a configuration of it 
and treat it as code. When you're doing automations, for example, the deployments can all be automated. Those scripts for deployment become a configuration item and they're treated as code. So if we want to change something in a deployment script, I have to go through the same rigor and discipline that if I would do if I was going to change the base code. And then as I do that, I run it through integration, uh, continuous integration, and make sure that it's still functioning with all the other moving parts. Uh, you may have some outliers still because they're just too difficult to deal with, but, but the concept is over time, you are treating everything like it was code in that you version it and you know when a change is made to it and you know that that change is going to work before it goes into production. So then you would run all your accepts and all your testing against that integrated unit and, your deploy and you can deploy to multiple environments because guess what, you've automated all the deployments. Continuous delivery is about building the right thing. So every business idea is a hypothesis until you get user feedback. What continuous delivery allows you to do if you're smart and you have the technical architecture set up to do this is if the business has an idea, you can actually move it into production fairly quickly, say maybe two or three weeks instead of two, three, six, eight months. And if you're smart and you have the technology and infrastructure uh, and architecture, you could actually segregate part of your customer base and have them try the idea out to see what the response is. And then you use analytics to figure out, is this something we want to keep continuing with or is it a dead end and we should just stop investing on it today? So you think of how powerful that is in that now I'm able to try out things and expand them over time if I want to, but if I don't want to, it's a dead end. Like just stop throwing resources at it. Uh, maybe we're not ready for it yet and we put it on the shelf, or maybe we just say bad idea and go on to something else. But you get that, you get real user feedback and that, that's what's important here. So, Another thing is about essential functions first. Uh, continuous delivery really reduces bloat in on the application layers. And I think also, if you do it right, it can reduce a lot of bloat on the infrastructure air, uh, area as well. So this is up here a slide that shows the results of a little survey that the Standish group did about um, how often features are used in different applications. So oftentimes, you know, with a big upfront, large delivery, what and design, design and delivery uh, with long cycle times, people think, you know what, it's going to be a long time before I get this chance again. So I'm going to throw everything that I could possibly need into the requirements and see what shakes out. And so what happens, and I'm going to tell them that everything's really important because I want to get my cut in the pie here. So, so what happens is that you land up um, with all these great ideas and you have developers working on them and you may or may not get the functionality uh, as you thought it would work, but partly, usually partly in the end, but then nobody ever uses them either because uh, the functionality wasn't exactly right. It was close, but not exactly right and it's more trouble than it's worth. Or, you know, it was a good idea, but nobody really uses it. Um, there's a lot of that. So you think of something like Word, uh, Microsoft Word has a lot of features in there. And I kind of look at it, I, I used to consider myself to be a really proficient user, user of Word, especially when I worked as a, a technical writer. And I look at it today and I just go, there is stuff in here, I don't even know what it's about. And you know what, I don't even care because most people, when they use a word processor, all they want to do is is type up a little document and put a few um, a few styles around it, and that's it, you know, and then be able to change it if they have to. So, you know, we, we land up with for this stuff and paying for the development of stuff that's never used. So continuous delivery, and you know, it allows you to say, okay, let's, let's work on the essential features first, and then the business is allowed to say, okay, you know what, that's good enough. We're able to get on and do what we had to do, and now we've got this other area that's really, uh, you know, with a swamp down here with alligators that we need to train and we need you guys in IT to help us with that. 
So usually what happens is you, you just get what people need, not what they want. Continuous delivery on the reliability and the stability, and so this is, this is where some of the big pushback comes, particularly with operations people. So they've been trained, and they're measured against the stability of their systems. And so the minute you say, I want to make changes to production more often, they go, whoa, can't do that. Because every time you guys make a change to production, everything breaks and becomes unstable. So what happens, and, the, and, and this, this is sort of the basis behind people getting really good at anything. So you think of musicians who are very, very successful. You think of athletes who are very, very successful. The only way they get to be really good and get consistent results of being on the top of the game is by practicing. And so, you know, take that concept and put it into IT. If you practice your deployments to production more often, you're going to get better at it. The other thing is if you're moving through smaller incremental pieces of change, what's going to happen is that there's less there's less moving parts that are changed that will create a problem within the production systems. Now, I'm not even uh, I'm not even ta considering at this point all the other things we've done within the continuous delivery process to make sure that the quality of what we're moving in production is quite high. So we already have a really high level of confidence that's going to work, but this is about Actually, the actual final deed of moving things into performance or, or into in, production is that we have a high level of, of confidence that it's going to work, but if something goes wrong, it'll be really easy to fix because we can just roll back. Practice makes perfect. The more you practice, the better you get. Smaller chunks, less problems to deal with. Continuous delivery also gives you better aligned people. So you've probably heard about DevOps and the concept of development and operations people working closer together in continuous delivery. There's also the concept that you really need to pull, the business needs to be pulled into this to make it work. And as they get pulled into the use of technology, what you'll find is that there's a lot of business users out there who are really uh, quite technically savvy. And you start working together. You have fewer operational silos. People understand how their, their you know, what their actions, what, what uh, equal and opposite reaction might happen over someplace else as a result of not collaborating. And as you get better and better at this and the business is involved in making the decisions, IT no longer is perceived as the bottleneck. Okay. The last thing about here is a shorter time uh, to recovery. So what usually happens when there are an incident or a disruption of service, um, it, it, it can be quite major. There's a long time to figure out what the heck happened, uh, why isn't this working, and then what happens is that you go, okay, I think I've pinpointed where the problem is, you work on it, no, no, that doesn't work, and then you have to go back and make sure that everything's working. So it takes a little longer time to fix. With continuous delivery, is, oh, something happened here, uh, no problem. I could roll back if I wanted to because I've got all this stuff in source control and it's not a difficult thing to just roll back. It's a matter of minutes rather than hours or days. Uh, so you say, oh, problem, make a decision, do I roll back? Well, okay, but then I go, okay, but I know where it is, I can fix the problem. You run it through again and then you're back in production much faster with the new feature. So it really is, allows you to have a much more shorter time to recovery when, you, when there actually is problems in production. So the full production pipeline, the automation of the tools, treating all configuration items um, like code, it allows you to know who did what, when, and why from the actual request from the business through to putting it into production. You can see how all of the configuration items are integrating with each other. All of your operations people know what's coming down the pipeline. They're involved and to make decisions about, uh, yeah, this will work, this won't. 
and the business always knows what's ready to go. Okay, so that's about visibility, traceability, compliance. Okay, pull your security people in, pull your risk and compliance people into inceptions and say, or, or after and say, okay, these are the changes we're going to make. What are your thoughts around compliance and risk uh, at this point? Is there, do you want to get involved in this to help us figure out solutions? What, what are appropriate solutions? Um, and get them involved, you know, take them out for lunch. Probably not your idea of fun right now, but, but you know, they are nice people. Uh, but, but get them involved early so that you're not having really awkward and what I used to call passionate discussions uh, when it comes to, you know, a day before you're supposed to go live. The other thing about continuous delivery is a really boon to disaster recovery. If you make sure that your deployment pipeline is backed up someplace, uh, if you have a total technical failure for any reason, you've got everything ready to go again. You can go out and get some infrastructure as a service someplace and just start it up and running again. This is a really new concept for disaster recovery and operations people, but I think it's one that has a lot of power and a lot of impact for them. Okay, we're getting to the end, and I want to talk yes buts. So these are common sort of barriers that are thrown up when you start to talk about continue going down the continuous delivery journey, particularly in organizations where you have risk and compliance people and uh, uh, security people. First one is about segregation of duties. So what it is, segregation of duties, is this concept that you want uh, uh, to prevent one person from doing undetected errors or several people uh, from colluding to, for nefarious purposes, usually fraud or theft. Um, so what you do is you put everybody in functional silos and, and then you say, okay, you can't actually work with other functions and you have to do reviews and checks and balances before things will go into production. And to do that, we're going to restrict, you know, testing act, uh, testers' access to testing only, developers' access to developer development environments only, and you've got to have a separate support team for production. So I kind of look at this and I scratch my head sometimes and I go, that's probably really the antithesis of what you want to do with segregation of duties, which is about uh, giving visibility and transparency into what's happening. Continuous delivery, in my mind, in a collaborative, open uh, environment where people, it, it's very transparent to everybody what's going on. You know, this, this whole thing about restricting access to different environments just doesn't wash. And you need to have that conversation if people, if, if you have your risk and compliance people taking that position, saying, you know what, you're holding back the business if we don't allow it to go this way. Now there's all sorts of things you can do to help mitigate risk and work through it and, and you know, uh, I've seen elaborate setups, but the most important thing you have to do is make sure that you're not stupid with your access. So what do I mean by that? Uh, first of all, no one should be using root passwords on the infrastructure anywhere, anytime. Uh, if, if anybody's making any change, it has to be on the concept of accountability, one person, one account, so that you can actually trace back who did what. And then when you have version control, you can do the diffs to see what the actual changes were. Um, don't use what I call generic accounts, so that's, you know, for testing or for any means sort of logging into the actual infrastructure and, or changing any of the configuration items. Uh, any of the changes that you make. So the generic account is, you know, we have this one account, everybody knows the password, everybody uses it. Because there's no traceability then. And then if you're using service, automated service accounts to do some of the work, um, make sure that they're monitored carefully by your security team and that you talk about what would be an exception to using this service account that should throw up alerts for the security team so they actually can go in and see what's happening with the use of that account. So again, it requires a lot of collaboration with your security teams, but it's not unsurmountable. You can overcome these, but you need to talk to them and they need to talk to you and everybody needs to understand that your common goal 
is to help the business and move the business forward and be able to jump on opportunities of the use of technologies when they're presented. So we talked about change management a little bit earlier, and, and this is another one that says, well, how can we follow the change management process? And I say, well, you know, with any process, the thing is that it should be changing over time. So if you have a change management process that's been um, developed and it says you must follow this path all the time, no matter whether you're doing a big change, a small change, a high risk change, a no, no risk change, that is not a good process. And the other thing is, is that your process needs to be able to move as fast as a technology. So if you've got a huge onerous change management process, you need to again sit down with your risk and compliance people and say, look, this doesn't work, we're preventing the business from moving forward, and IT is actually inhibiting the value that the business uh, can have. So we need to have a talk about what types of controls and what types of fast tracking we might be able to do using continuous delivery. Your solution development process, again, most auditors, risk and compliance people know the waterfall approach really, really well. Uh, your job would be to talk to them about continuous delivery and show them how the tools are used in the automation and the visibility, openness, and transparency actually reduces the risks uh, to a far, uh, so that they're far less risky than, than a big bang uh, upfront uh, waterfall approach. So the last thing is actual risk with continuous delivery. Um, this needs to be a planned approach. Chaos doesn't work. You need to be quite transparent and visible about what you're doing. You need a lot of discipline. Everybody needs to understand uh, what you're trying to do. You need to set some standards for using version control, um, uh, coding practices, that sort of thing. But uh, it, it, it does require discipline, and it requires a management team that's going to be supportive of their teams and allow them to make mistakes, but at the same time, keep them on straight and narrow so that everybody works in the same way. You need to deal with your technical debt as you go through continuous delivery. There's a lot of ways of going faster by doing quick, dirty fixes, but they will bite you in the end. And you need to deal with your technical architecture as well to make sure that you start decoupling and can make changes without you know, having um, a high level of impact on other systems. Um, you need to, during each inception, each iteration, is save some time to deal with technical debt and recognize that this one thing you have to do as part of the process. And then the last one is take time, some time to understand IT risk, learn the language of uh, controls and you know risk and compliance, and have conversations with your security people and your risk and compliance people, uh, and develop a relationship with them that's a little more amicable than, oh, here they come, I'm going to run and hide, or I've got a meeting, sorry. <laughs> So, in the end, what you want to do, you know, when you have big, huge pieces of work, what happens is you, you also have higher risks involved with them to your costs, reputation, the magnitude, the effect if things go wrong. What continuous delivery does, it allows you to move everything into smaller pieces and actually have tighter control on how things are done so that you have more, a, a better chance to realize opportunities when they're presented to themselves and you know, some of the larger pieces actually become more acceptable. So these are the references that I use. Uh, ISACA has the IT risk framework. Uh, the book by Jess Humble, Dave Harley, Continuous Delivery. Uh, Jess also has a website that's listed there, continuousdelivery.com. And there's also a microsite on thoughtworks.com, if you haven't been there already, that, that um, has a lot of uh, information. <laughs>